so excited to be here. Um, my name is Angela Moss, and I'm here to talk with you about how to create a proactive healthcare system. The United States healthcare delivery system is in flux. Many have even said it's broken. So much so that we've recently seen big players like JP Morgan, Amazon, and Berkshire Hathaway team up to create their own healthcare delivery company. The problem with our current healthcare system is that by and large it is passive, whereby we in the healthcare system wait for people to come to us. And that is true whether people are seeking treatment for illness or injury, or they're just looking for health information. Healthcare delivery is not passive in our country because we don't all agree that prevention is the ideal. And it's not because providers don't want to do outreach and preventative type of care, but because it's just too hard in our current system. It's expensive and it takes a lot of time. However, I believe we can achieve a care delivery model in this country that is accessible, affordable, and effective against measurable outcomes, and that we can do this for our most vulnerable populations. We can do this with a proactive care delivery model where we focus on prevention, while also proactively building relationships in innovative, non-traditional settings and spaces so that we have the mechanism to connect with our target populations. To achieve this, we need to flip our current healthcare system, and we need to bring healthcare to the people by leveraging the built environment. And by built, built environment, I mean where people live, work, and play. That's what proactive healthcare means. So 10 years ago, I met a remarkable human being. Her name was Sue Jin, and she was a legendary businesswoman, entrepreneur, and humanitarian with a deep commitment to community service. Her company was called Flying Food. You can see a picture of the truck there. And what her company did is it uh, caters meals for airline passengers, destined for airline passengers. So if you've ever flown an international flight out of Chicago O'Hare, you've probably eaten a meal prepared by the employees of her company. And these are food service workers that are working on the lines, truck drivers, cooks, warehouse personnel, who all contribute. It's this fascinating industry that's behind the scenes. And um, you can see here in a picture, this is a picture of Sue Jin, also a picture of the truck that raises up on stilts to go to the side of the airplane. And then in the picture in the far right, you can see the actual trolleys that you might recognize from being rolled down the middle of the aisle in the airlines. And just like the airline business, the airline uh, food service industry is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the year to provide meals for the passengers on airlines. Shortly before Sue and I met, she had visited a retail urgent care clinic after becoming ill while traveling. And remember, this was about 10 years ago, so retail urgent care clinics was still somewhat of a novelty. And after that experience, she decided she also wanted to do something novel to help improve the health of her employees at her, within her company. Because you see, although her employees had health insurance, Many had limited access to healthcare services and even less information about healthy lifestyle choices. Her vision was simply to make her help her employees be healthier. And luckily for me, I was invited to work with her on this project through a partnership with her company and my employer, the College of Nursing here at Rush. As a nurse practitioner, I knew nursing and the traditional healthcare delivery models, but what she was envisioning was something completely different from anything I knew to that point. So in order to make this work, I had to think more deeply about measurement and outcomes, about finance, and not just whether this is a nice thing to do for people. Sue was a wonderful mentor in this, and as a result, my thinking about healthcare delivery models, the prejudices in the larger health system, and topics related to social justice were challenged and reshaped. So in the beginning, um, we had a little bit of a rocky start, and I spent most of my time in the uh, employee cafeteria, which is the picture in the upper left-hand corner. So for about eight months, uh, once a week for four hours, I sat in the cafeteria with a blood pressure cuff around my neck, and a stethoscope around my neck, and I was talking with employees. And the 
time I spent there was spent assessing the population, but really building trust and getting to know people um, more than treating patients and helping make them be healthier. After about a year, things turned around, um, and today, oh, I, don't think, I think I lost my mind. And today, um, almost 10 years later, the program is robust. The kitchen has about 400 employees, and every year we have over 7,000 visits annually in our health clinic, which is, there's a picture of it here. And um, should I do something about my mic? Can you guys hear me okay? Keep going? Okay. And um, we have two nurse practitioners who share 24 hours a week at the health clinic, and they address immediate concerns ranging from ear infections to backaches, but also chronic health problems like hypertension and diabetes. And um, we have many, many health sciences students who contribute to the success of this program. These are nursing students, occupational therapy students, and also health system management students that are integrated into the program. But the greatest thing about this whole at Flying Food is the way that we're able to truly impact people's lives. So I want to tell you a story about one of my patients. I'll call him Joe, although that's not his real name. And when I met Joe, he was 40, 54 years old, and he worked for a better part of 30 years, two jobs. So he worked the PM shift from 2 to 11 at a factory, and then he got off work there and went to work right straight from there from 12 midnight until 7 a.m. So when he first came into the clinic, the reason he was able to meet up with us was because he, we had scheduled the design of the clinic to meet the needs of the employees. We were there on site. They didn't have to go anywhere else. We were already there. Um, we had early morning hours so that as he came off of his night shift, he could just drop in for a few minutes and see us. And so that's how I first met him. He was kind of curious about the clinic, didn't really know what it was all about, and so stopped in to see us. And when, um, when I first assessed him, I found that he had wildly out of control blood pressure. His blood sugars were also wildly out of control. Um, he said uh, that he had had some hearing loss, and he, remember, he's a, he's a factory worker, and so he drives heavy machinery in the warehouse. So he had heavy, considerable hearing loss in both ears, and he also had um, significant memory deficit, memory deficit problems. So um, we know that the consequences of insufficient sleep can be catastrophic that it causes um, inability to concentrate, it can cause obesity, diabetes, hypertension, it can be a contributing factor for substance misuse, and also early premature death. But Joe didn't know any of this because he hadn't seen a health care provider in over 20 years. And when I asked him why, he said, well, because I didn't really feel like I was sick, number one. But number two, if he had gone, taken the time to make a schedule, to make an appointment to see a health care provider, he would have lost out on that tiny, narrow window of time that he had to sleep that was already not enough, clearly. So at that initial visit, what we did was we came up with a plan and to address all of it and prioritize the health need, you know, what was important to him in his life so that we could help him lead a, lead a full and meaningful life. Um, and slowly over time, it took us about three to four months, and we, I met with him about three to four times a week, and each time I met with him was only about five minutes. So if you imagine, you hear healthcare providers, myself included, we kind of complain about the 15 minute window, you know, you've gotta see patients every 15 minutes. Um, at the, in this setting, 15 minutes was really a luxury because most of the time I was seeing employees, remember the airline industry is very fast paced and employers are working to try to get their food prepared so it can get on the plane on time so the plane is not delayed. So all of the people sitting on the plane aren't sitting there waiting for the, the food so they can take off. So it's really fast paced and I had to narrow down the time that I was seeing patients to five minutes or less. So, and, but we were able to do it. And I believe we were able to do it because we were there regularly. We got to know people, they got to know us, and so we didn't have to do a lot of the um, prep work that is required in a more traditional healthcare system and healthcare model. So one of the other things about Joe's story is that it is really compelling. I, I love the story about Joe, and there's many other stories about other patients that we've seen at the Flying Food Clinic with, whose lives we've impacted. So yes, it does seem like it's a nice thing to do. It's a nice story. 
But we also have hard data backing up this program in terms of improved biometrics and health information across the board. Better hot blood pressure, better, better um, hemoglobin A1Cs, um, better improved waist circumference for the patients who come to see us at the clinic. We also have a decreased absenteeism and presenteeism, which is important to the employers who we're partnering with to provide this service. Um, we have high utilization and satisfaction rates among our employees and also with our partners, the employers. And for those of you who are concerned about financial sustainability of a program like this, we are able to produce the same, if not better outcomes, health outcomes for our patients at less than half the cost than if the patients were to access a traditional healthcare delivery model. So here's a representation of the model. And you can see there are three main components to it. There's the primary care component, there's the wellness and health education component, and the research and scholarship component. And this is where we measure our outcomes, some of that data that I was just mentioning, and also where we test and learn new initiatives that we want to try out and kind of see if they work in this, in this setting. But you can see by looking at this, this really isn't rocket science. And a lot, all of these elements of, the, of this model are, exist in our healthcare system now. So what about this model makes it different? And what makes it successful? Why do we have such positive outcomes as a result of this care? Part one of the answer is that we are leveraging the built environment, that we are bringing healthcare to the people. We are being proactive and intentional about our programming and we have tailored it specifically to meet the needs of the employees where the employees are at that moment. And, and we've done it with the resources we have available to us. But there's part two. Part two of the answer is the human side. And this is equally important to the success of building a proactive healthcare system. So what happened was because we were there on site in a place where the people worked, that whether we really intended to or not, we became part of the community and part of the family and part of the, the culture there at the kitchen at Flying Food. So it became a symbiotic bi-directional relationship between ourselves, the healthcare providers, and our patients, rather than the more traditional unidirectional uh, relationship where it's I, the healthcare provider imparting knowledge. This concept was not easy for me, and truthfully, I really didn't get it at first uh, because, again, I was coming from a more traditional model. And for the longest time, I was more comfortable keeping things separate where I'd wear my white lab coat um, to, and keep my personal and professional very separate, where certainly the people, my patients, were not doing that amongst themselves. That wasn't the culture where I was. And so what I was doing by wearing my lab coat and separating things off was that I was... I, w I was differentiating myself and I was creating a power differential unintentionally. I didn't mean to, but that's what I was doing. So eventually I figured this out. It took a little while and I stopped wearing my white coat and I began to be more open about my personal life, my family, my opinions, my goals, the things that were important to me. Some of the pictures on the slide are the things that I share with my patients. I let them know I have kids and that I you know, like to, I don't know, go for bike rides whatever it might be. But in doing this, what I found was that age, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, education level, all of those things, while they're important, are really, they really didn't seem to matter in the context of the shared human experience. There were all sorts of challenges in my personal life while this was going on. You know, I've had, some of them were happy, some of them were sad. I had children, I lost, you know, had the death of a loved one. Um, but I shared these stories and others with my patients and I let myself be vulnerable and I listened to them in turn because they were listening to me and I learned from that and it helped us connect. So the magic is that we developed human connections because sharing our humanity is one of the, the most profound ways we can connect with others and empathy is the great normalizer. It helps break down barriers and differences and helps us get at the heart of why we're there. Because if we listen to our patients and have built a trusting relationship with them, however we do it, in this case, this is how it worked for me, then we better understand where they're coming from and how we can help them get to where they want to be in terms of their physical health, their mental health, and their overall well-being. So now I humbly share my story and my pictures like I am with you today. Um, 
because it's my hope that in doing so, I'll have the opportunity to also listen to the stories of the people that I encounter. So what happened next? So that's the flying food story. So what did we do with this? Um, fly, and again, as I said, it's, it's robust, it's living on, we're loving it. Um, we have lots of patients and good outcomes. Um, but I've made it my mission to take the things that I've learned in, the, in this process of building this model and apply them to new settings to see if we can scale it up, to see if we can bring it to other people. Fortunately, I've been able to do that through my current role, my administrative role, and my faculty role in the College of Nursing. I have access to lots of students, and I have, I think I kind of fly under the radar a little bit because we're in a university setting, so we can try out these new, newfangled ideas and we get away with it for a little while. Um, and what I did in the College of Nursing is, together with the dean and my faculty colleagues, was we applied these flying food lessons to the entire college's mission and vision for social justice, community outreach, and educating future, future healthcare providers to work in this same space. And our goal was and is to help others see that changing the healthcare system for the better is not a hopeless and overwhelming cause, but that it is possible. We were able to do it, and then we did it again. And we believe this approach worked. So today, through our faculty practice program and applying this model, this, this, these philosophies from Flying Food, we have over 30 community partnerships whereby we leverage the built environment and we have over 60 nurses and nurse practitioners who work with vulnerable populations across the city of Chicago replicating this model. We have over 30,000 student hours every year where the students contribute to the wellness programming and the outcomes and evaluation of these programs. So here on the slide are a couple examples. The one in the upper right corner, this is, it happens to be named after Sujin, but it's a Sujin Health Center. It's located just a few blocks from here on the west side, and it's located in a low-income housing complex, and we care for about eight to 900, uh, mostly women and children. And we do primary care services and wellness, just like we did at Flying Food, but we're in the built environment. That's the common thread. Um, this one in the lower right-hand corner is a picture of the most recent one. Um, we started it about six months ago, and it's also here on the west side, and where we have a primary care and wellness clinic for formerly incarcerated men and women at, at a supportive housing organization called St. Leonard's Ministries. And that's going well as, as well. So let me be very clear, I did not do this alone. There have been many and still are many, many people who share this vision and hope for a proactive care, uh, healthcare delivery system. Like I mentioned, there's a, Amazon is a big one. And there, I, this is not, there are other people who are interested in doing this kind of work. Um, it would probably take hours for me to read a list of all the people who have contributed to the success of this program. But the point is, that this has become a collective effort and a shared vision for all of us. So here's some parting thoughts. I believe we can change the healthcare delivery system, but that it must start with each of one of us. To be sure, acute and hospital-based care is important and will always have a place in our healthcare system. But building new care delivery models like this or others that are more proactive rather than reactive is absolutely essential to the health of our nation, and particularly so for traditionally underserved populations. If you want to do this, the first rule of thumb is do not wait for others to bring the change that you want. Instead, be the catalyst for it. Go ahead and flip the healthcare delivery system in whatever way is meaningful for you and meaningful for the patient populations that you're trying to reach. Keep an open mind so you can recognize opportunities for change when they present themselves to you and don't give up easily because this will be very hard work but it will also be very rewarding. The second rule of thumb is to work to inspire others to join you. And when they do, mentor them. Tell them about it, share your ideas, and bring them with you on your journey, but also then let them grow into their own vision. Recognize and celebrate their achievements and know that you cannot do this alone if you truly want a big change like this to be sustainable. And the third rule of thumb is please don't forget your humanity. Let yourself be vulnerable so that you can connect with others wherever they are. Listen to your patients. You will be more effective in your role because of your connection, and I believe happier and more fulfilled because of the relationships you build with them. We should all be considering how to solidify our legacy along the way, 
not waiting until the end to figure that out. And if creating a proactive healthcare system is something that speaks to you, then find a mentor and others who are interested in this kind of work and just do it and make it happen. Thank you.